Hello? 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 This is the Vancouver Weather State Podcast. Okay, so we're here with Manveer Tagger. He is the project manager and partner at Common Ground Consulting. How are you doing, Manveer? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Yeah, good, good. Thanks for coming down uh, to the studio. Yep, thanks for having me. Uh, can you maybe start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Um, so my name is Manveer Tagger. I'm one of the co-founders and partners at Common Ground Consulting. Um, Common Ground Consulting is a project management and development consulting firm um, based in the Lower Mainland in Metro Vancouver. Um, What we do or the gist of what we do is we act on behalf of developers and landowners uh, all over BC and from feasibility and due diligence analysis all the way through to the whole building permit process, we handle all the sub-consultants and kind of manage the project. my personally, my background's in civil engineering. Uh, so I went to post secondary at BCIT. I did my civil engineering there. And then I worked at uh, McElhaney um, and Centris Engineering, which is a, a firm on uh, Surrey as well. Um, while I was there, I was working, you know, strictly in the land development uh, division and, and, you know, working on servicing designs and grading plans and subdivisions and townhouse projects and industrial projects. So um, while doing that, I kind of uh, knew I was interested in, in, in this industry and, and, you know, saw an opportunity where, uh, along with my partner, who's also a civil engineer, but uh, we both saw an opportunity here where we can add value for developers. And, and there were some things that we were seeing weren't being done as, uh, as efficiently as maybe they could. Um, so we saw the need for it and then we jumped on it and, and started this company. Yeah. Right. And why, why real estate? Um, so to be honest, my family background's always been in construction development. Um, my dad immigrated, well, my parents immigrated here early 1990s, um, and took up obviously the, the, you know, typical, in, uh, immigrant story of, you know, working whatever job you can get back then and found himself um, doing construction. He was a framer. Um, So he eventually started his own framing company and then slowly, slowly started building homes and then slowly, slowly started doing subdivisions and townhouse projects. So, you know, seeing that from a young age and kind of always had that, uh, always had that idea in my head. So your dad is, is a developer. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So why, uh, it's, it's curious because you know, one of the sort of obvious routes would be to join the family business, mm-hmm. um, and presumably you help out. But yeah, uh, but w- how? What made you go the engineering, the civil engineering route? Um, well, it's a good question. I think there's a lot of things that kind of added up to or resulted in that that happening. Um, the one of the things being, you know, when in high school summers I would, um, you know, work as a framer with, with my dad and his company. And I quickly knew that I wasn't built for it. (laughs) (laughs) It's really, really hard work. So I was like, well, you know, I better go to school. Right. So, um, and I was always kind of thinking from a young age of, you know, how, how can I, you know, really forge my own path in this industry and, and kind of add value where I can and, and learn and, and, you know, do all these things. So, um, I was always kind of looking towards engineering as something that I'd be good at. Um, so that's kind of why I decided to go in that route. And, um, once I did that and I really loved what I was doing, but, um, there was another part of me that wanted to, to do something and build something new, um, that was fresh and, um, you know, could, could add value for, for developers, landowners, everyone. Right. Right. And, and I'm just thinking because, like, in in line with that, you you had you were with two successful engineering companies, mm-hmm. and then you decide to go out on your own. Mm-hmm. So, can you talk about that? Like, what, was that a similar desire to kind of build something on your own? Yeah, I guess so. I think um, you know that value that experience was um, really really valuable for me. I mean, one, you know, working with McElhaney, which is a bigger company, I kind of got to see how they operate and. 
um, you know, their corporate structure and all that um, and work with some really good people there. Um, and then at Centris, when I, when I first started there, it was a smaller company. And, you know, working with a smaller company, you kind of get to do everything and a mm-hmm. little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, so that experience was very valuable for me, too, and in, in learning kind of how a business is run and, and what to do and things that come up, right? Um, but I just, I honestly, doing the engineering work, I just didn't um, feel like I was fulfilled. I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, I liked it, but I just couldn't see myself doing it for the rest of my life. And, you know, this idea, uh, the common ground consulting idea kind of popped into our head then. And um, I thought it was some, it's something that really excited me and it excites me to this day and I love doing it. So um, that's, that's kind of why. And, and so common ground started like how, what year? Uh, formally under this name, early 2022. Okay. Yeah. And did, can you, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Um, like, can you walk us through the kind of gap in the market you saw? Like, was it was it that there was you know the other firms are are not involved in what you're doing, or yeah. just walk us through that that kind of uh, yeah. identifying the gap and yeah. and why it exists and how you fill it? Yeah, I just felt like you know with a lot of our engineering clients, um, you know whether they were construction guys who, you know, had picked up sites, but their specialty was building the site to somebody who was just an investor, to somebody who was a developer that did it all. I still saw a lot of, you know, inefficiencies, like I mentioned, where um, I just thought, like, there has to be a better way to do this. I mean, and, you know, with today's conditions, like, time is more valuable than ever. Right. Um, So I thought that, you know, everyone should kind of focus on what they're good at. Like if, if you're a construction person, focus on the construction, right? If you're an investor, just focus on investing. <laughs> just right? Focus on providing the cash. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not easy to do. No, right? no. Um, so that's, that's kind of how that idea started. And then, you know, just having that um, engineering lens, I can say, on, on, on the whole development process really got me thinking and then how it should all be broken down and, and certain ways to do things and who is the best at, you know, doing what for other consultants and, you know, those relationships that I had. So that whole kind of cocktail mixed together, um, I saw that not really, there wasn't really anyone else offering that service. And it was a service that not only I saw, but a lot of our clients were, you know, approaching me and saying, hey, like, why don't you just take care of everything for me? Like, I don't want to deal with 10 different consultants. I don't want to deal with the city. And I got better things to do with my time rather than sit there and follow up on emails or reply to this person or that person, right? So all that put together kind of, you know, planted that idea in, in, in my head. And, and then it was just a matter of um, building a business plan and building a system that, that caters to it and that really executes on it. Um, you know, I might my background's in engineering. I'm not a good salesman or, or, or anything like that. Or even, I don't even consider myself, a, honestly, a good business development person. But my thing is that um, just figure out how to add value. If, if you can prove that you can add value and you are adding value, then, then that's all really that matters, right? So it's, it's even, it's when I think about like how many moving parts there are in development, it, you know, there's the, there's the knowledge to actually like how mm-hmm. do we, get this from soup to nuts um you know kind of where or the origin of of like buy, say buying a parcel of land and then developing it all to the end yeah the knowledge there of getting it built but then there's also this whole the systems approach of getting it done in a really efficient manner yeah where you're just you're constantly tweaking so that and I, presumably you're saving a lot of time for people yeah, yeah. I mean, we're confident that, you know, for most of our projects, I mean, obviously, depending on the scope and, and what kind of permits are needed, but we're pretty confident that projects that we do versus some that are owner led, we can save them four to six months uh, right off the bat, um, which is huge, right? Wow. So, you know, with the way we operate too, is it's, it's that same kind of value add I'm going back to where it's like, okay, you, you bring us onto the team and if we save you four to six months of interest payments, it's, 
it's kind of a good deal, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Kidding. Yeah. And, and, and Manvir, how many people at Common Ground right now? Four. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just curious because it, it's like the, the, the process you're helping people walk through is, is complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, going out on your own is complicated. Yeah. Uh, the, I love the kind of simplified, we just need to find out how to add value. Like mm-hmm. that's like the crux, right? Yeah. But building those systems... Uh, to to ensure that you're doing that is complicated. Yeah. There's a lot of moving parts to to the business. Yeah. I'm just out of pure interest sake. Like, what's what's been the biggest challenge so far in mm. in Common Ground's journey? I think the biggest challenge is really figuring out, like, for one, the the processes, like our internal softwares that we use, our templates, our systems that we have set up. That's that's always a dynamic kind of thing, and it's an iterative process. So we're always kind of tweaking it as we go, and, and saying, okay, well, how could we have done this better, or what came up here that came up didn't come up there. Right. Um, I think part of the challenge that comes with it is each project is so different. Even if it's like twenty townhomes here and twenty townhomes here, there's still so many differences between them, and each client is different in terms of what they want to build and how they want to build. Um, so and then you're working with different municipalities, different municipalities, different consultants. So it, it gets, because in its iterative process, it just keeps getting better with time. But, you know, I think it's, it's the only thing you can do is commit to that constant improvement. Right. Um, but what we like to do with all of our projects is, you know, the earlier, the better for everything. So, you know, figuring out what the owner's goals are with it, figuring out exactly what our roadblocks are to getting there, um, figuring out how are we going to market this unit at the end, these units, um, who's our target, um, what's our budget, where's the contingency, where's the risk. Um, and, you know, in terms of the municipalities, you know, we've, we've gone to a point now where we have good, strong professional working relationships with, with most of the planners and, and, you know, decision makers at these municipalities. So, mm-hmm. you know, obviously fostering those relationships and, and even with the sub consultants, you know, we know who is probably best for what job. Right. And we like getting involved early because, you know, for example, one of the first things we do is we'll send out RFPs for all the consultants and we'll review, you know, four or five quotes for each thing. And we'll say, okay, you know, this price is here, this price is here, but what has this guy included and what has this guy included and what have they done and, you know, what's their current turnaround prod time looking like for their projects? Um, you know, we're working with them on this site and this is how that's going. So right. kind of p- passing that value on to our clients, right? And and we do have some clients that are quotation bigger developers. Um, but, you know, the other thing is, is right now we have, I think last I checked, 27 active jobs on the go. So, you know, under our umbrella, um, e- each of our clients that are maybe the smaller and medium-sized developers, they kind of get treated like a bigger developer, right? Mm-hmm. Because when we're dealing with these architects or dealing with the city, they're dealing with us, right? So it's just kind of gets pushed into one. Right. So all those added values that a, that a bigger developer might see that a smaller medium might not, um, we... we pass that value on and do you like just to kind of in for someone at home who's thinking like okay like what what type of asset classes like mm-hmm. can you talk about first of all what type of projects are you working on and then also like how small of a project is too small to take on no projects too small <laughs> okay. Okay. but like but just to like hypothetically somebody has you know, the new zoning comes in, you yeah. want to develop a four place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, is that too yeah, small? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. No, I understand the question. No, like, so... <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to go... Well, let your, me, let yeah. me break it down for you. Yeah, no, no, I was just kidding. I was just teasing <laughs> you. But, um, yeah, I mean, we we kind of have, like, the whole spectrum. I mean, our smallest job right now is, like, a two-lot subdivision, single family, um, and all the way up to, like, um, apartment buildings with 500 units. Um, everything in between, wow. mixed use, commercial, rental, um, like there's a lot of work we do that involves the MOTI, that involves the Ministry of Environment, TransLink, that kind of stuff. Um, so we like to kind of keep our keep our net open mm-hmm. and 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 
you know, depending on each project, as long as it makes sense for the owner and for us, um, we'll, we'll take it on and, and see where we can help. Are you doing any government contracts or is it all for private? private yeah, we're, we're getting into that. There's some that I can't really speak about now um, that are just at the finish line, but not exactly there. Okay. Um, but we are, we're doing some work for like Canada Post um, and, and yeah, getting into that space as well. But uh, it's, it's a different space, right? So it's trying to balance that. I think our, our bread and butter is the private guys. And I think part of that comes down to um, going back to your question earlier about the gap that we saw is there isn't there, or at least that we saw somebody in the consulting space that really understood the private developer and, and what their concerns were and what their needs were. Um, so that's kind of what we're tailored for is, is those private developers and, and helping them out. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are, we are getting into the public space as well. How is your, how is your, um, opinion of like what you thought you would be doing when you started the company versus what you're doing and, and where you're seeing yourself adding value changed over the last few years? Well, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I think there's just so much more to it than than meets the surface. I think a lot of times, um, wh- whether it be general public or the media or whatever, they we just see, oh, you know, land developer builds a building, sells it, and moves on. But th- there's just so many moving parts, and, and it's an organization that, that the developers are running, right? It's a company. It's a business. There's people that work there. There's people that depend on it, right? Um, so... I think working through the process with different developers versus from when I started from just an engineering lens, um, you really get to understand all of the complexities that come with it and all the moving parts and and everything, right? So um, to answer your question, I think that I understand now, I I sympathize even (laughs) with developers a lot more than I did uh, when I was an engineer or practicing as an engineer. Um, and I think part of our, our business and that iterative process of always trying to pr- improve is managing all of those complexities. So not just the bottom line of, you know, s- your selling price, not just how long did it take you to get a permit, but more so, okay, what does this project mean to your brand? What are we trying to leave? What kind of impression are we trying to leave here? Um, you know, what's our five-year, 10-year goal, right? And and we've been lucky now to work with some awesome developers, especially in Surrey and Langley, who, you know, are family-owned companies, and we've done multiple projects with them now. So we kind of feel a part of their company now. We, we, we have that kind of, you know, attachment to it, where it's like, we want to produce something that's, that's good and um, delivers to the community and, and, you know, helps everyone grow. How's... How's the market in your mind right now? Like, I, I'm kind of curious to to hear about your take on the the real estate market from your kind of unique vantage point. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, like we were talking about earlier, there's kind of two sides um, that I personally use to gauge where things are at based on our work. Um, one is the feasibility and due diligence studies that we provide um, for people. So, you know, they might tie up a site and have a due diligence period and want to do their homework on it. So we'll come on and, and we'll start um, start investigating it. That When that's really busy, that tells me there's a lot of transactions happening or, or people are looking to make moves. Um, the other side is the permitting process, which I guess now thinking about it can be break, breaking down into two further things. So the permitting process is there's times like last year for sure we saw a lot of hey let's get this project to third reading and pla because my bank needs it right not not so much hey let's get the permits because we're gonna build it right (laughs) so that that tells you something right where it's um and we saw a lot of that last year where now you know if you're some of those guys who did you know get their third readings and and plas and rezonings and whatnot they might have wanted to sit back and say, you know what, let's hit pause. Um, let's see how the next six months go. Let's see how the next 12 months go. We saw a bit of that too. So that tells you, you know, where things are at with some of the bigger developers in the industry um, versus 
if guys are saying, hey, start to finish, we need to start ASAP, we want to break ground by this date, and we're ready, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that shows more optimism on where things are at and, and what they expect, right? Um, so that's kind of the two sides of it that we see. Um, right now, I'd say first quarter of this year, we've seen a lot more optimism um, from our clients, but the the tangible change just isn't there yet, hmm. in, in my opinion. Like the um, people are saying, coming to us more, saying, "Hey, you know, I'm looking at this site, or I'm looking at that site, or hey, I want to start building this next year," but the actual work and the actual execution of those deals and you know moving the process forward in a, an aggressive manner mm -hmm. just just isn't there i think and i think you know when this cycle kind of started me personally i always thought oh you know 2022 let's say it started um i thought oh by 2024 we should we should be turning the corner the woods yeah <laughs> right. But I think every year that goes by, everyone's like, oh, maybe it'll take a little bit longer. Right. Um, so I'm not pessimistic about it. I, I think it's still a great spot to be in, a straight, great industry to be in. And I think it's it's going to definitely ramp up in the future here. But I just don't think today we're there. And uh, and, I, and I think that um, it would it's going to be a, a longer turnaround time than, than I think most people expected. Mm -hmm. uh, has the blanket rezoning changes had an impact on your business or who's reaching out? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, with the, especially with the ministry um, announcements with uh, Bill 46 and Bill 47, a lot of more people reaching out and, and a lot of, honestly, confusion um, because even dealing with different cities, cities have these plans set up where they have these neighborhood plans that are accounting for X amount of people and X amount of schools and infrastructure. Now, those take three, four years to build and, and get approved, right? It's quite the process and it's a lot of work that, they, that the planners do there. Um, whereas now, you know, we throw this into the mix and it's like, okay, well, how does this affect what we already had? And, and you know, some of our active applications as well, we're, we're in this sort of limbo where even the cities don't know yet what they can ask us for. And um, I don't know if we wanna kind of date this um, conversation we're having, but by the end of June, 2024, they should, right? But the last couple months have been very interesting because, you know, for example, we've had one project in Surrey that was, um, outside of the neighborhood plan area where they were doing the transit oriented um, kind of development along Fraser Highway. And, you know, we were working with the developer and we kind of talked to the city and we said, hey, like, you know, we think that this property should be included and, and this is why it makes sense and whatever. So it ended up being included. Now we've made plans and submitted for comments based on that, but then then the ministry comes in and says, well, actually, you could do this, too. And so we're like, okay, we'll do that, too. Great. Right. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then now you're asking the city planners to give comments on something that they didn't necessarily plan. So right. it puts them in, in, in right. quite the tough spot as well. Um, so it's it's been interesting. And, you know, I have, I, I applaud a lot of the, the planners for the way they've been trying to implement it. I mean, imagine working on something for four years and then it all changes, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just, this is the first time I think we've talked about this, but the people that had per, uh, permits in process, yeah. that now I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of people have absorbed a ton of costs and are now pivoting or trying to change, for sure. see what else they can do. And maybe it's more profitable, but um, also maybe you're out of pocket for yeah. design and yeah. a whole bunch of things, right? Yeah, it's just, it's part of that, you know, kind of exercise you have to do is, is it even worth it, right? Um, and I think that um, part of the challenge is that for the last, since the announcements were made, um, there's just more questions than answers. And, and you can't really expect anyone to have answers just yet. So mm -hmm. put put a lot of people in a, in a funny place where, um, should I stay or should I go type of thing, right? right. So, so 
w- we, we've been working with the municipalities on, on that on a lot of our projects, to be honest. Um, and even with not only the transit stuff, but even with the single family stuff, someone who's doing a <coughs> 27 lot subdivision, <coughs> excuse me, they might be thinking, well, do, how does this affect me? Right? What, what does this change for me? And so, I mean, you saw like in the township of Langley, um, they just rescinded all the third readings. They said, okay, well, everyone come back to the drawing board, right? Um, I had a contact of mine. He had fourth reading, final adoption, legal documents, everything ready at the township of Langley. And then this came up and I was like, okay, well, now what do we do, right? So I think in the, in the short term, it's just, I think once everything's figured out, it will be good. And, but I think the part of the challenge that, the ministry has been dealing with, city's been dealing with, we've been dealing with, developers been dealing with, everyone's had to deal with this, um, is kind of dealing with those unknowns and, and planning based on something that you don't know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we've even had people come to us and say, well, you know, obviously it'd be better if I do a quadplex instead of a single family home. And, you know, our answer is, well, not necessarily. I mean, you know, if, if the city's engineering services plan has accounted for, you know, let's say it's 10 lots, right? They've accounted for 40 people in this subdivision. Now you're telling them it's 160. Right. Well, where's the school? Where's the police presence, right? Where's the fire protection? Um, where's the parking, right? Um, all, all these things, right? So what if they, you know, one possible thing is, you know, to address these very valid concerns, the city could say, okay, well, we're going to con- collect a, a fee, Right, an added fee on, on you know, um, let's call it like an infrastructure fee or a additional density fee, whatever you want to call it, right? right? That needs to be worked into your performa too, right? Or l- what's what's the code it's going to be built to? Are you going to have to have like four firewalls in your in your house, right? Um, is it going to be a rental requirement, an affordable rental requirement, secured by you know housing agreement? Is it going to you know require all sorts of things, right? So I don't think it's, it's definitely not as simple of an answer as I think a lot of people expected it to be. Right. And I think throw in the market too. Yeah. What what does the market actually (coughs) want? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's a huge thing, right? Because it's like, okay, well, if you're figuring out what is, well, what is this going to sell for? There's no really comparison. Yeah. Would, I mean, personally me speaking, I think I want to, live in an apartment where I have my own parking and my own amenities and it's kind of planned for that rather than a, a one suite out of four in a home, right? It's kind of interesting. Like we've talked a little bit on the show about like early laneway homes just mm-hmm. being like, you're like, man, these are garbage. And uh, or for a lot of them are garbage. And then it's like over design wise, the design is, yeah. has really gotten a lot better, but you're like, I wonder what the early, Ooh. you know, like if you're early days on these, four or six bucks or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's like presumably 15 years from now, they're going to be, or they're going to have it sorted in a way that they don't know. Yeah. yeah. Or the other example is like, you know, these four plexes where say they're each a thousand square feet each. What we're seeing a demand for right now is like larger duplexes, mm-hmm. half duplexes where yeah. people have like 2000 square yeah. feet and Six they don't actually want suites. No. Right. Like they, they want the space yeah. and they want new construction. And so how many developers are going to build the, you know, the half duplexes now that they can maybe build four units or six units, depending. So it's it's kind of yeah. like there's lots of unanswered questions yeah. in terms of the product type that will be created, but it but is will also be marketable. But it is interesting like if you're an 800 square foot back unit on a single mm-hmm. family lot, like, yeah, yeah maybe you... Maybe a condo is actually yeah. the better, yeah. the better option for a lot of people. Exactly. So it's like, what's it, what's it going to sell for? And you know, we're in City of Surrey. We're part of the um, Development Advisory Committee, and and what that committee is is we work with um, the City of Surrey and their planners and their designers to kind of brainstorm and kind of just talk about these changes and and, yeah. and plan to see how it's going to affect everything. And um, they've done a really good job, um, I got to say, on, on kind of floating out certain ideas and getting professional um, input on, on some of the things. So, I mean, they, they're they taking into account, okay, well, how is this, how many lots do we have that are going to be changed by this? Um, you know, what is a design going to look like, a cookie cutter design on a, on a 
on a square lot, on a rectangle lot, on a cul-de-sac lot, yeah. um, all those things, right? So they're doing the best they can, but I think just with the, anytime you have sweeping changes like this, it's, it's a bit of growing pains, right, you're gonna see. And are you, like as a civil engineer, is the lower mainland ready for this kind of density in terms of the infrastructure that supports our current housing? And, and I mean, that's a, maybe a tough, yeah. cause I mean, I guess it's <laughs> municipality ba- like yeah. every municipality is different, yeah. but you know, I mean, we, we've definitely had people on this show say that certain municipalities are the infrastructure is just mm-hmm. not there to support it. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I think, uh, that's, that's a very good point. Like, um, you know, I've always, you know, with my partner or other people in the in the industry, we always talk about there's a lot of land in the Fraser Valley that's dedicated for development or designated for development. Um, where I think some of the supply issues come in is the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, in Surrey, just mentioning one area off the top of my head, West Clayton, right? West Clayton's plan has been out for years and developers have bought up in their years and they have third readings and rezonings in place for years, but it's just a matter of the infrastructure. Once that first domino falls, you're gonna see a lot of units and projects coming there. Same thing with South Surrey, um, Darts Hill, Redwood Heights, those areas are designated for development, bought up, ready to go. People are waiting to start their projects there, but it's just infrastructure. But so, and can, for somebody listening that, that doesn't understand, like, w- waiting for the infrastructure so is that like you're waiting like can you spell that out what exactly does yeah so first domino look so like? well first thing is being your drainage sanitary and your water right right so for some areas it's like okay well typically a development's responsible for their frontage right so you got to build out your frontage your neighbor's going to build out his if you build out his he'll pay you for it later once he develops right obviously it's subject to certain things but generally right, right? um what the problem is, is if, if let's say us three are three different properties here and, and the pond's going to go here at the corner of the stable and, and you're on the upstream end of it and you're saying, okay, well, I'm ready to go. And the engineering department's going to ask you, well, where are you draining to, mm-hmm. right? We need a pond down here and then we need the services to be pulled up all the way towards your site. For most sites, that's going to kill your project. You can't absorb that kind of cost, right? right. So... What usually happens is some of the the bigger developers, they bring the infrastructure, and that's how it's typically happened, um, where they'll build the pond, they'll dedicate the land for the pond, they'll build the trunk sewers, and then they'll just do something called a developer works agreement where they'll be reimbursed for it later, depending on how much area you have, how much land is flowing towards that pond, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but in conditions like today, who, is going to up the capital yeah, on the, yeah. yeah. And so you have even more properties that are locked um, from development because they're just, they're, the infrastructure is not there. So I guess circling back to your original question, um, in terms of added density, I think the Fraser Valley from a social, economical, and cultural standpoint is ready for it. Um, but I don't think... In infrastructure is, is something I'd be worried about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious because, man, Veer, you've, you were ra- born and raised in Surrey. Um, we've been criticized on this show as being Vancouver centric <laughs> and our uh, comments on on maybe the valley in general, like uh, sometimes bewildered or, or looking at certain what projects sell for 1100 mm-hmm. a foot, 1150 mm-hmm. a foot. Um, can you talk about your, th- like, watching Surrey change, um, yeah. but then also, or the valley change, I guess, but then also, um, you know, how, is it, is it a, do you think about it as um, being an extension of, of Vancouver and the lower mainland, or do you see Surrey as something in its own light now? Like, I think the Fraser Valley, Vancouver is a global city, right? So I think... Um, the Fraser Valley and the area surrounding it will always kind of be an extension of it. Um, but you're starting to see, at least in my opinion, these cities and you know surrounding areas really start to establish their own identity and presence. And you know, I think 20 years ago, if you if you thought of Surrey as l- like 
now versus 20 years ago, I think you think of Surrey less of an extension um, of Vancouver. And I think it's growing into its own kind of metropolitan place. Um, same thing with Langley. I think, I honestly, I love Langley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's a great place. Um, you're seeing a lot of young families there and, you know, there's a lot of new projects and it, it's, it's starting to get this sort of sense of real community and, and, and identity there. And, and you're seeing that all over, right. All over the Fraser Valley. So I think you're right. I think, you know, this is Metro Vancouver and, and it'll always be that way just with the city that Vancouver is. I mean, driving here today on a day like today, you can't beat it. Like it's just a beautiful place. Right. Um, but I think, the areas surrounding it are also starting to, I guess, stake their place and, and really get an identity and, and kind of grow into their own kind of hubs. And, and if you, like, thinking about areas you're excited about in the Fraser Valley, is, is Langley kind of it in terms of from an investment perspective or, yeah. or a future? Um, I guess it depends. I'm a little... Depends on the area. Depends on what kind of my goals would be. Um, listening to your podcast, I know I know the niece question. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Matt's, Matt's drafting it as yeah, we speak. Know. Yeah. Writing it over. <laughs> you have a niece. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I don't know. For me, I'd ask my niece like, "Well, are you going to live here, or are you just is this on the side, or how long are you going to live here?" Um, I think all those things matter. But I think Metro Van as as a whole. Obviously, we'll have our ups and downs, but it's I'm positive on the whole area. I mean, I think Vancouver, all the way to even Chilliwack, I think in the next 10 years, it's, it's just going to see more and more growth. So I don't think you could really go wrong. You know, one thing I'm thinking uh, from your kind of vantage point is um, where the opportunities are and where the demand is uh, from the vantage point of of the people that are building the housing, mm -hmm. you know, for three years from now, for five years mm -hmm. from now, like, are there certain areas where you're like, oh man, there's, there's a lot of talk about X area or Y area where, where there's a lot of like early stages, this looks exciting from a development perspective. And mm. what kind of housing is that? Like presumably out in, in Langley, Surrey, it's townhomes that yeah. are it, but, or, yeah. or maybe smaller multi, although Langley is kind of changing yeah, so that's the other thing. I think, um, you know, going back to how the landscape's changing in some of these cities, um, growing up, you didn't see a lot of apartment developments um, that weren't, like, in the hub of the city or in the downtown of the city. Um, now you're seeing a lot more of that. And, and I think um, municipalities have kind of changed their stance on it, where I think some of the previous, you know, stance on it was apartments and mixed use should only be where the town center is and, and mm -hmm. where the transit is. And there's still some of that, but I think it's kind of grown to a point now where people are understanding that, okay, if this is uh, going to be a big city, there's going to be, be a lot of more people that need an apartment rather than a townhouse or that can only afford an apartment rather than a townhouse. Um, with that being said, a lot of the newer plans do account for that. A lot of, like for example, in the township of Langley, um, they are kind of pro-density. Um, the current mayor and council, they are really pro-density and, and as long as you're satisfying, you know, all of the concerns they might have or design considerations and, and infrastructure considerations that they're open to seeing more density. But I do think there's also that always going to be that um, uh, suburban feel that's desired in these places, mm -hmm. which is why I think townhouse product and duplex product is is really valuable in these spots, and it's hard to come by these days. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Manvir, maybe as a final question, I know you you kind of talked a little bit about kind of the the false start in the market, like mm -hmm. how we've you know in twenty twenty two you thought well by the time we hit you know twenty twenty four we're going to be, be rocking, we're right gonna be rocking. <laughs> <laughs> which, which yeah. go back to listen to our episodes for the past uh, two years <laughs> and you'll hear a lot of that, but it, it is kind of this idea that 
it does feel like the market, you feel like it's starting, then it's stagnant. Yeah. It feels like it's starting. Yeah. But any thoughts on the balance of uh, 2024 and maybe is, is 2025 that year? <laughs> well, I hope so. Um, <laughs> it's actually just before you answer, it's a, you've kind of, Common Ground was started in a great moment though. Right? Yeah. Because it, like you're, you've kind of set the, the, the framework for mm -hmm. like the next run. Yeah. It'll be, yeah, for sure. And I think, um, you know, with the balance of this year, we are starting to see, you know, people dust off the wheels and start to get things going again and, and start to look again. And I think a lot of it is everyone's expectations have kind of recalibrated to where they need to be. I think last year what you saw was a lot of people who were looking for stuff were in line with the market, but people who were looking to sell weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just human nature. Like, you know, two years ago, they were getting offers for X amount and now it's, you know, 15, 20% below that. And they're like, kind of like, it is what, what it the is. heck, right? Yeah. So I think I think that's that process, that psychological process as a whole has mostly run its course. And I feel like everyone's pretty understanding of where things are at today. Um, I think obviously it, it comes down to the interest rates, right? Um, and I think, you know, even if they bump it down by, let's say, 25 basis points, it's not going to make the world of a difference on your performa. But just mentally for a lot of people, I think it's, it's especially in Surrey and Langley, it's going to start making a difference in, in how they, how aggressively they start to look and how they start to plan for the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's funny, but we've talked about this recently about Vancouver being an emotional market. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like that there's like, it, it's a lot of people say, well, you know, 25 bips, like what's that going to actually yeah. do? But in reality, it's it's a signal that yeah. it will be hard to ignore if you're a buyer who's been sitting on the sideline. Yeah, yeah, honestly, I think uh, to kind of agree with you, I think Metro Van as a whole, it's this industry is is emotional in, in some senses. Um, and I think once they see that, you know, we always laugh that uh, my partner and I about, you know, if you ask a certain group of developers where the best area in Surrey Langley is to develop, you can figure out who their friends are yeah. just by the answer they give you. <laughs> you know, you got yes. your Langley guys, yes. your Willoughby guys, you got yeah. your South Surrey guys, you got your Annie Deal guys, right? So it's it's funny. There's always that that that's dynamic at play. A, that's such an interesting point. Yeah. 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 You can't no matter how much uh you kinda can't can't take the emotion out of the yeah. out of real estate. No, it's no human nature. How, right? Even if it's yeah. your straight yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's fascinating. You know, I was just going to say uh, in terms of recalibration, um, I was talking to somebody yesterday who's a asking about this kind of inventory spike. And I think that's exactly what I was trying to explain to, to this person was I, f I feel like there's been, you know, supply sitting on the sidelines, mm -hmm. waiting, waiting last year. Yeah, it was too. It was like there's we're now at this kind of there's a new normal. Yeah. And it feels like it's normal yeah and last year it didn't feel like it's normal and people are like all right let's roll mm -hmm. and then you see you know a huge spike in inventory because everybody's like oh, i was waiting for it to go back to two percent <laughs> it's just not gonna happen so yeah anyway i, I can definitely see that man veer we have this uh, segment called the five wire five light-hearted questions uh, that we end every show with can you stick around for that for sure yeah okay so question number one is one book recommendation for our listeners Book recommendation. Um, I think I'd say Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Have you ah, heard of that? Wow, that's, that's a, good one. a that's a new one, right? Yeah, it's it's. I think it's <laughs> no. gained it's gained it's gained popularity. I think recently. <laughs> oh no, yeah, but it's yeah. A, it's a very it's, it's very old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear about it till like <laughs> it didn't gain. Uh, I didn't hear about it till recently. So yeah. I think it's yeah. it's kind of that whole kind of branch of, of thinking has gained some traction yeah. lately. But yeah, yeah. And, and you've seen Gladiator, so <laughs> you're, you're, you're good. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah, I really like that book. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like that book. Um, I think uh, it's important to kind of understand what you can control and what you can't control, um, especially in our industry, right? So yeah. um, kind of focusing on, on what you can control and, and what's going on in your head and the external events are the external events, right? And right. they're going to keep happening, good or bad. Yeah, that's interesting. We I've, we've talked a lot about that um, with, I mean, obviously in the market, like in our industry for yeah. sure. It's like you control the things that you can control and yeah. 
everything else is just what it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's just more so chaos. just how you how you react to chaos, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, what is one new habit or belief that has impacted your life over the last couple of years? Wow. Especially building a business, I guess. Yeah. Uh, new habit or belief? I guess. Um, yeah, I guess the belief that you know you got to make sure. Again, coming back to this industry, and I'm sure you guys deal with this too and anyone who's starting a business really is or any ambitious person um is to not delay your happiness right i think we get caught up a lot in especially in this industry of the next thing or here's my next goal or here's what i want to accomplish but and then the mistake some people make i think is they think that it that relates to how happy they are and I think that's not true. Mm -hmm. I think you got to find, obviously have those goals and ambitions. You have to, right? You have to have something to aim for next. And then as soon as you have that, you should aim for something else, right? But I think you should really fall in love and, and find a balance where you're enjoying the ride and you're, you're enjoying the journey. And that's something that I've kind of um, adopted. And, and I obviously have my goals and I want to be to the next spot and then the next spot and the next spot. It's just how we are as, as people. Right. But I think, um, kind of having that focus on, on enjoying the ride and, and being, you know, content with what you're doing day to day and enjoying that and, and finding happiness in that. So basically you gave up social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, yeah, I don't know. We think about that all the time, but that idea too is like the uh, process of, um, if, if when you get to the goal, it's, the happiness is not waiting there no, for you, right? No, I mean, like yeah. that's the thing, right? Yeah, uh, so yeah, 100%. You, you have to learn to enjoy it's, the ride. It's so hard to do too, right? Because it's just like, you might not consciously think that, oh, I don't think anyone consciously goes to sleep at night and says, oh, once I do this, I'll be happy. I don't think people yeah, yeah. think like that. But even subconsciously, it's more so you're, you think that just because you're working towards something that that's what you need to get to and yeah. that's the prize. And that's yeah. great, but also finding a way to to enjoy. If your whole self there. worth is tied up in in that exactly goal, in something that's not really the goalposts are always going to change for you, yeah. right? Like if you five years ago versus ten years ago versus where you are now versus five years from now, ten years from now, the goalposts are always changing. So there's no need to get too hung up on that. Favorite music or band? Music or band? I'd, for music, I think I'd have to say. Drake, even though it's kind of a mainstream answer. <laughs> well, tough, tough to be a Drake fan. <laughs> yeah, a lot <laughs> of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. But yeah. um, I don't know. I just think uh, he's so uh, versatile. He's got a song for everything, right? Yeah. And he's been doing it for so long. So listen a lot of him. Um, to be honest, though, believe it or not, recently I've gotten into country a little bit. Oh, I thought you were going to say Kendrick. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Yeah. Uh, who, yeah. Who are you? Yeah. Who are you? <laughs> this is interesting because yeah. somebody yeah. just texted me about country this morning. Yeah. So Morgan Wallen's a big one. I've been ah, kind of listening to. Comes up on that the comes up on the show all the yeah. time. All the time. Yeah. I think what happened is my one of my friends he uh, he made a playlist like a country music playlist, and I wasn't sure if he's. I've never even like really listened to country music, but I kind of started giving it a listen, and I was like, oh, some of this is pretty good, right? Yeah. yeah. So, listening to a little bit of that now, it's nice. Is this a male or a female, Morgan? Morgan Wallen? Yeah. He's a male. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> you know who this person is? I, I don't know any of their music, but I did yeah. know it was a I think he's male. honestly probably the only artist I know. I know how the songs sound in the car, but I don't know the names of them. Or oh, okay. I, just, I just literally <laughs> go to my friend's playlist and hit shuffle on yeah, it. Yeah, right, yeah. So. Right. Nice. Yeah. Right on. Uh, something you've been binge watching lately, favorite movie, mm. recent movie? Uh, I recently... Well, I tried to watch it like years ago, but then I, I don't know what happened. I kind of just lost my place and gave up. But I've been watching Mad Men. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's it's pretty uh, good. Are you, yeah. are you, th what season? Are you uh, almost? Season through? five. Oh, so you're into yeah, it. Okay. I'm into Has it now. Has more uh, in the office? Yeah, so that, that scene <laughs> was pretty funny. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty cool, pretty cool show. Just, I think, you know, they like sneak in kind of historical events yeah, in there yeah. too and how yeah. people were reacting to them and. Just the conditions back then. You right? know what? It's funny though. I feel like I don't actually. I shouldn't comment on suit style, but uh, yeah. it's old enough now where you're like, oh yeah, that spurred on like a whole yeah 
Yeah. Skinny ties, the whole thing. That yeah. Is now, is that still a thing? I don't know. Maybe I'll ask Yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I'm not... Sh- I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Speak to skinny ties. <laughs> no, I think in, in terms of the show, I think it's, it's, it's just cool because it's not really a show where sometimes a whole lot is really happening. Or yeah. like, it's not like yeah. a lot of action or <laughs> yeah. wars or anything that's yeah. going on. Um, but it's just, there's certain things that kind of, for me personally, that are, are kind of thought provoking about how people reacted to certain things and certain dynamics in terms of even, you know, the professional world and yeah, the personal yeah. world, right? right? Um, you know, certain norms that people followed then that seem so weird now, yeah, but then you yeah. start thinking about the norms now and, hey, maybe that may be, be, might be kind of weird, right? So yeah, yeah. it's it's an interesting watch. I'd recommend it. That's great. Uh, last but not least, something under $1,500 that you've purchased recently that's had a positive impact on your life. Under $1,500. Oh, I'd say golf lessons. Ah. <laughs> Long overdue golf lessons. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I've also done that. Didn't yeah. work out. Uh. I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of frustrating. It's like you're taking a step back, right? You, yeah. You take the lessons and get worse for yeah. a bit. And yeah. then if you don't continue, like I started working on it. Yeah. And fell off and yeah. then like, I'm back to yeah. on. But uh, anyway, how... Uh, how uh, how can people find out about Common Ground Consulting, uh, more about um, what you guys are doing? Yeah, they can reach out to me. They can go to our website, commonground-consulting.com. Reach out to us there. Um, they can email me, my first name, Manvir, M-A-N-V-E-E-R, at commonground-consulting.com. And I'd say, um, you know, don't just reach out only if you're a developer or only if you have a project. If you have that, great, reach out. Um, but anyone in the industry wants to grab the coffee, have a quick chat, um, even young people looking to maybe join our team or wanting to know more about kind of the opportunities there. We are trying to grow the team a bit this year. So, um, yeah, basically anyone listening, feel free to reach out and, and touch base. That's fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Manvir. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. It's fun. Right on.